Hi everybody, Zeev Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master. Welcome to this video. And in this one, I'm going to talk about, or actually answer a question by a doctor that is currently participating in the Implant Gold Rush Master's course. Uh, he shared with me a very interesting case where he had a failure of an implant uh, early on, about two weeks into that. And I thought this was such an interesting case uh, to share with the community, not just keep it within the course. And I emailed him back, uh, first of all, gave him my feedback, but asked him for permission to share this case because I think there's a lot to learn from this case. And he said, okay, so I'm not going to expose his name, although he doesn't, he didn't do anything wrong. And he said, it's not a problem whatsoever, but I just want to focus on uh, the fact. So I call this an implant failure in good bone, meaning good bone quality in quantity. And what we intuitively are thinking is that when we are placing an implant in dense bone, we're reaching very high torque values, uh, very good initial stability, that the chances of success are relatively high or very high. And that was not the case. So I wanted to share with you the uh, periapical radiograph. Uh, right after the placement, you can tell that the implant is well positioned, at least in the mesodistal direction. Uh, you can see also this was a great indication for an implant, uh, an adjacent, two adjacent teeth, uh, one with a crown, one, one with a restoration. And what looks like very good bone quality, very dense, a lot of um, radio, uh, I would like to call it radio opacities, uh, that to me at the moment look beyond normal. Uh, I'm not necessarily looking at this as a, an ankylosis or, or anything pathological, but very dense bone quality all the way from the inferior alveolar nerve, which we see a hint here, uh, all the way to the crest, maybe a couple of radiolucent areas, but all in all very dense bone quality. So what I wanted to do is share with you the email the, this uh, nice doctor was an excellent uh, surgeon uh, emailed me. So he said, Dr. Simon, uh, I would like your input on a failed implant case of mine. I placed an Astra EV, which is the new, uh, relatively new Astra uh, implant design, 4.8, meaning a wide body by nine millimeter. Um, seems like it was possible to go a little bit longer, but it, it, it doesn't make a big difference. In the number 30 site, so the lower right for a smaller position. So the patient was seen for a follow-up two weeks after the placement. Everything's to every everything seemed to uh, seemed fine uh, with good healing. And today the patient had a hygiene appointment and she complained of pus draining from the implant site, meaning an infection. Okay, so this is the first alarming uh, or the first red flag. Uh, the patient first noticed the drainage a few weeks ago, but she did not alert us because she figured she was coming in for cleaning soon. Uh, that's a mistake on the patient's part. If there's anything unusual, past drainage, pain, discomfort, uh, prolonged after the procedure, uh, every patient should have the common sense to call. So it um, uh, sounds like the doctor took a periapical radiograph that clearly showed that the implant has failed to integrate so relatively soon. I'm not sure about how many weeks after that, but it seems like a very short period of time. And here's the x-ray uh, that was taken at the same time of the hyg hygiene appointment and, and obviously shows that this implant is failing. There is clearly a radiolucency around the implant. There's some loose, uh, what looks like loose bone particles at the coronal part of the implant. Uh, it looks like the radiolucency extends all the way to the apex of the implant. So this implant obviously has failed and uh, in a very short period of time. The question is why? Everything seemed to be going well with no major concerns during the surgery. So really the question is why? So let's keep reading the email from this doctor. And uh, what he's saying is that he, he, I'm seeing this patient this Thursday morning to remove the implant and graft the defect. So do you have any tips on anything else that could be done at this point? So we need a little bit more information. So he attached these two radiographs the before and after, after the placement and just uh, recent when the implant needs to be removed. 
and a couple more, a, a little bit more information that is very pertinent. So uh, I would like also to mention that during the implant placement, I did run into trouble. Okay, so we know that something was going on uh, in the following way. The bone was quite dense, which is uh, obvious from the radiographs, and the osteotomy definitely had more resistance that I've been accustomed to. Okay, and that's again to be uh, expected looking at the radiographs. When it came time to insert the implant, it would not seat all the way to the full length of the osteotomy. I had to back out the implant three times and re-drill the osteotomy before I finally was able to insert the implant to full depth. Even at this point, the torque needed to accomplish this was higher than I would have liked. I will admit, Dr. Simon, that, that I do not feel good about this result. Okay, so we'll leave this uh, for later. So when you're drilling into an implant site and you're feeling great resistance, first of all, make sure that your drills are brand new. Okay, that's, uh, you know, we can use, reuse surgical drills, but when you're dealing with a super dense bone, uh, just reach out for a brand new burr so it has the best uh, cutting ability uh, with, no, uh, with no trouble because if you are using a bird that is relatively dull, has been used before, you're overheating the bone, number one. Uh, but regardless, you will still f uh, feel the resistance. So uh, for dense bone, you need to use a hard bone protocol. I'm not sure this was used in here, meaning you use all the drills uh, available in the sequence you also use your tap drill, create the threads within the osteotomy, so the implant goes in ease. And even that sometimes is not enough. I used a, a, a method that is not that accurate. Obviously, it cannot be done guided. I used to take actually a larger burr just to extend the coronal part of the osteotomy so the implant actually falls in. Uh, I'm not sure if this would have helped, but what the doctor is saying here is that it took him three attempts of drilling an osteotomy, placing an implant, backing the implant out, drilling again, backing the implant out three times. That created heat, uh, that created p potential trauma to the bone. And what I think is really the key here is this bone is not very vascular. It's uh, extremely dense and we see actually more failures. Now, uh, in terms of torque values, uh, the doctor felt that the torque value was higher than he would have liked. I'm not sure what that means, but anytime we have torque value that is over 15, 20, 30, 25, 30 Newton centimeters, uh, I'm satisfied. I'm not looking for torque values that are 80, 90, 100 uh, Newton, Newton centimeters. I don't think that's necessary. That can lead to uh, potential necrosis of bone pressure necrosis, although it was never proven. But in my experience, when you're over torquing an implant, that can lead to failure. So, so the doctor feels that he doesn't um, does not feel good about the result. Feel the, feels a little bit disheartened, and want to do everything to make it pass uh, to make it right again. So, look at the quality of the radiographs. It looks odd, but I didn't think too much of it because I had extracted the original tooth in 2014 without an incident. Uh, another important information here is that the patient has is scheduled for hip replacement. Now, he didn't tell me why. Is it a um, typical hip replacement for uh, because of osteoarthritis? Or was there an injury? Was the patient had, an, had a uh, hip fracture because of osteoporosis? And maybe this patient is taking some osteoporosis medication like Fosamax that can make the bone a bit more dense. Last but not least, uh, the dentist spoke to the patient's doctor and she wants her to call her, after the, uh, call her after removing of the implant to assess how bad the infection is. And based on this info, they'll decide to proceed or delay the hip replacement of the surgery. To be perfectly honest, I'm not completely sure how I would assess that. I've taken out a failed implant one time before a few years ago. It wasn't that bad compared to removing teeth that had per per a huge per periodontal disease with abscess and tons of granulation tissue. If I could get your thoughts, that would be greatly appreciated. So this is a really interesting case. Uh, you placed an implant in what you thought was great bone quality, extremely great, extremely dense. That was obvious from the radiograph. You drilled into the bone, it felt hard. You created your osteotomy and I assume you followed the protocol. You placed your implant and it wouldn't seat 
Why? Because the bone is just too dense, no flexibility. So you backed out, okay, you had no other choice. You drilled again, maybe you extended one more drill, maybe you moved your drill a little bit to create a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, increase the diameter of the, the osteotomy, maybe you used a tap. You placed the implant again, it wouldn't seat. You backed it, backed up again, drilled again, placed it. This created trauma, no way, no way around it. It's not necessarily your fault, you, you, you did what you needed to do, but this created trauma on the bone and could have created some overheating. Now, again, like I mentioned before, uh, it would have been great to check if you used a fresh burr, brand new burr that was never used before to make sure that it has a very high uh, efficiency in cutting and creating the osteotomy, number one. Number two, I believe that this failure, which is considered an early failure before, before actually the time for, for you to check integration, I believe it was a few weeks, uh, stems from the fact, not so much the overheating, not so much from uh, drilling and re-drilling, placing and taking it out, uh, in and out, uh, is the fact that this patient has very dense bone. And dense bone does not have a whole lot of vascularity. I see in my own hands higher, higher failure rates with extremely dense bone. And last but not least, think about the patient's medical condition. Maybe there were certain medications that create dense bone. There are certain pathological situations that can create dense bone. I'd like you uh, to look into that. And again, just a quick tip in regards to the handling. Once you drill for an, oste drill an osteotomy and you place an implant and you decide to back it out, uh, you, may, you need to ensure that this implant is not just uh, laid on the tray, which I know it wasn't, but uh, has, be, has been put back into the implant container. If you have any doubt, just reach out for a new implant. So in conclusion, don't be misled by extremely dense bone and great initial stability and high torque values. You're getting a false sense of security. And many times extremely dense bone quality will actually lead to failure, especially in the anterior mandible, not so much in the posterior mandible. Make sure you look into the patient's medical history, the reasons they're getting the hip replacements, their medication, that would be uh, important to know. And also important to communicate with the patient about the failure, explain uh, what are the reasons, and try to predict this uh, problem before the surgery and communicate with the patient about the challenge and let them know that the bone is actually too, too dense and sometimes problems can occur. So they're already prepared that their case is a little bit challenging. So when the implant actually fails, which it did, uh, the second conversation about the failure and what needs to be done is a little bit easier. So a little bit of uh, preparation. Now, uh, what to do next? Of course, the implant needs to be removed and uh, the infection debrided, all the loose bone particles removed, uh, irrigation with saline, but I would not graft the site. <laughs> bone is not a problem here. Okay, wait for the healing to occur naturally. Don't graft. Let it heal by itself and go back into the site and try again. No guarantees. It may, it may fail again. I, it's hard to tell. This is extremely dense bone. Uh, the reasons that made this implant fail in the first place can make it fail again. So good conversation, good communication with uh, your patient, good consents, and uh, go for it. You need to make sure that the site is uh, clear of infection, relatively simple, like after an, an, an extraction, uh, irrigate. Uh, this patient uh, is going to be clear for her, uh, his or her hip surgery. Uh, no problem once this implant is out of there. Okay, so. Thank you for sharing this case with me. Thank you for allowing me to share this with the surgical master community. This is a case everybody, every doctor that is involved in implant dentistry and surgery uh, can learn from. And I appreciate you for that. Thank you so much. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave some comments below. Uh, feel free to forward this video to other dentists that may be uh, interested in these types of uh, implant complications and problems. Implants are not perfect. We do see some challenges every once in a while. We're discovering new challenges as uh, technology evolves and improves. Uh, we're seeing other problems, so implants are not a perfect solution, but they're pretty great. Uh, thank you so much for watching. This is Dr. Ziv Simon, creator of Surgical Master, and I'll see you in the next video.